Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today, which is all about camera calibration. First, let us introduce ourselves. Um, here online is Peter Eastway, Matt Granger, and my name is Oliver Muse. So let's um, introduce ourselves. Peter, are you there? I'm here. That is good. I can hear yes, you quite good. <laughs> Just checking that you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That is that is um, uh, quite amazing. Um, I'm sitting here in Europe, in Switzerland. So Peter is where? I'm in Sydney. It's a uh, bright and sunny afternoon. The sun's just dipping down, and you're, I believe, just starting your first cup of coffee. Is that right, or are you on to your second? That is absolutely right. No, the, the second coffee, and it's sunny um, here as well, but um, also snowy. So, yeah, winter. No. Um, then um, we have Matt. Matt, are you there as well? Hello, I sure am. Hey, where are you sitting? In? I'm in Your office as well, a bit south ah, of um, okay. Peter. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you both are um, also photographers. Um, let's talk about that. What are you doing? Well, I guess I'm sort of called a little bit of a landscape photographer, but I actually consider myself being a photographer across uh, all genres. So I've shot everything from advertising to, uh, to weddings, family portrait to fine art and uh, calendar shoots, things like that. Um, I publish Better Photography magazine, so uh, some of the uh, listeners may have uh, been to the Better Photography website or even bought one of those old-fashioned things called magazines, which <laughs> are paper and that you actually flip the pages through. Yeah, right. And so uh, I've been uh, doing that for around about uh, 30 years, but I I'm only 27, so I haven't quite worked out how that works. But uh, anyway, okay. math okay. maths wasn't a strong point. Okay, Matt, are you, are you also old-fashioned like uh, Peter? <laughs> with, with well, the papers uh, and magazines. Funny, <laughs> funny you say that. I um, I'm right now today organizing books for my book launch, which is <laughs> on tomorrow night. So um, I hope people are still buying paper. Yeah, of course. <laughs> they certainly are, Matt. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> of good. of course, of course. Yes. Um, and what kind of um, uh, photo do you shoot? Oh, yes. Um, I think we are actually maybe in the same market, Oliver. I'm um, all about shooting people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'll shoot a landscape as long as there's someone there to talk to and someone in the frame walking through the landscape. But um, <laughs> I specialize in art nudes like yourself. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, so um, my name is Oliver Muse. That is the, the guy with a very strange German accent, so sorry for that. Um, and when I'm looking for a word, just help me, please. I'm Matt and Peter. So, <laughs> um, yes, and uh, I'm the responsible person for uh, the customer service data color global wide. Um, if you have um, questions in the end of the webinar, then, then, but please, um, in the end of the webinar, type in your question and we can um, clarify everything, of course. We will read your question loud and clear so everybody can hear that without your name. So um, don't be afraid um, to, to ask questions. There is no stupid question, believe me. And uh, we will answer that, of course. Um, yes, and I'm a photographer as well. So I do glamour and uh, lifestyle and fashion photography and fine art nude, so, so stuff. Um, yeah, that, uh, let's begin with our webinar. The webinar is, um, that is what I already mentioned, all about camera calibration. Um, there is a lot of color management for your camera, but we have one tool in our portfolio, in our data colors portfolio, that has nothing to do with color. But believe me, it's as important as the other. And that is the spider lens call. You see it on the right side. We have the spider cube. That will be um, one of our topics today. Spider cube is the contrast and gray balance for your pictures. The spider checker, which is here in the middle, is a color reference. So it color balances your images, your raw files, um, to be more precise. And we have the spider lens call that is um, the tool that has nothing to do with colors, but it will um, help you to, to calibrate the autofocus of your camera. And how that works, look here. That is the spider lens call. The spider lens call is um, a quite simple tool, yes, uh, but it helps you to measure the autofocus. So what can 
you know, what can go wrong in, in, uh, with the autofocus of your camera. This is the little, I don't know the word for that. What is the word? Um, autofocus measurement point. What is the word? Focus so, point. Uh, the focus point. Thank you. Oh, uh, ouch. The focus point. Um, I here in that example image, I put it on the on the second hand of the watch, and um, what went wrong here? So the camera measured a wrong distance. So the focus was was set to a longer distance. Um, then here you see it on the right side. So it's the, the focal point, the sharp point is behind the second hand. So that can happen because of tolerances, body and your lenses, of course. The age of lens because of you use that and yeah, usage and, and fading. And <clears throat> I, uh, in, in, uh, so the, how to say the temperature. So if something is, is cold, it, um, it's um, it's tighter, and if something gets um, warm, then it's wider. So the same will happen with your camera as well. And those tolerances are the reason why your um, camera is hmm, not in focus, so more or less out of focus. And um, the solutions are quite simple. A calibration um, can fix that always. The calibration can be done by your camera manufacturer. So just send in your, your camera and the lenses and they will do that for you. Um, or do it by yourself. Just use such a tool, um, the spider lens call, and uh, then measure the autofocus. That is quite simple. It's easy and it's um, really yeah cheap. It's inexpensive. In your experience, um, Oliver, mm -hmm. You know, across all the people that you get feedback from, are more lenses front or back focusing when they're inaccurate? Um, that is 50 50. Um, so, what we did is in Photokina um, around about three years ago, which is in Cologne in Germany, that is the, the world's biggest trade show. So, um, or a photo That's trade show. on earth. Yeah, that it really. Believe me, really. Um, so, but all what I know from Photokina, and that is also true, I know our data color booth, and I know the way where to the restrooms and nothing else. <laughs> so I'm always, <laughs> always at the data color booth. So um, we gave that, or we offered that as a free of charge service. We asked the people in magazines and newspapers, bring us your camera your camera body with one of your lenses. And we will measure the autofocus of your camera and we will fix it all. We will calibrate it if your camera can do that. And um, of course, if it's necessary and you want it. So we measured close to 1,050. I think I remember it was 1,043 wow. cameras in that whole week. And guess how many camera lens combinations we really um, improved in out of focus? Ooh, Most of them. Six, <laughs> you won't believe it, 650. So yeah. more than 60%. And um, the, the, the big surprise was it, um, it, it, I expected, okay, all the smaller cameras, so the let's call them beginner DSLRs, I don't know a better word for that. Sorry for that. Um, I expected those cameras are um, the, 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 uh, the critical ones, you know what I mean? Um, mm -mm, it was balanced. So uh, for example, a 5D Mark II was as often in that list as a, a 3 or 450, whatever um, it, it, it yeah, was, right. when, uh, which was the, the current body then. But um, that was quite, really quite, um, quite um, interesting to see. So um, uh, what happened here? Um, a, zero, a zero tolerance would be, of course, perfect. This is what I um, did here in my little graph. And that graph is just out of my mind. So that is uh, just to talk about something. So zero would be perfect in focus, um, the lens and the camera. And mm -hmm. I added a scale. And let's, um, let's do the, the plus three and minus three is intolerance. That means a tolerance uh, with 
maybe 2.9 is okay and the camera would be in this in in the on the market in the end yeah you know what i mean so uh, so what what you're saying is the the camera manufacturer would ship it out the door and say that's close enough yeah of course mm -hmm. yeah there's always a tolerance they are um, manufacturers on market like um, you know the brand with the little red dot where you pay uh, <laughs> round where, about where do they make those <laughs> <laughs> where, where, but they don't have any autofocus. But you see, hey, um, such a camera, and it's just a small system camera. You pay, um, yeah, I don't know how many how many um, um, Australian dollar it is, but that is more or less a, a, a yeah a used mid range car and not an old one. <laughs> so that is yeah. true. So a, a, a normal manufacturer like 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 Canon, like Nikon, like uh, Pentax, like whatever. So um, they have a tolerance, and that is normal, and that is okay, absolutely okay. So, um, but what happened here? Well, if, it, yeah, it, sorry. Yeah, it is okay, and then of course it's not because often you'll change from one camera to another, and you'll think. Oh, how come my lenses aren't as sharp as they used to be? I've got uh -huh. a new camera; it should look better, and it doesn't look better. And I've I've had that experience many times. So, yeah. um, I, I don't think we should be so lenient on the camera manufacturers. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, if the tolerance would be zero, of course it would be perfect. So then we don't need to 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 talk about uh, camera calibration or um, the autofocus calibration. But uh, we have tolerances, and we can live with that. But when the when the tolerance is going to the let's call it to the to the same direction, that means the camera and oops, why it's not working. Now, <laughs> the camera has here in my uh, little graph now a 1.8 and the lens has a 2.2, round about that, maybe 3. Um, then it's going to the same direction, so that means they 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 compensate each other. It equalizes the, the autofocus. So I would be happy with that lens um, and I wouldn't recognize that there is room for improvement, but it is. And you can measure that and you can see that. But what if one of these both um, components, here in that case the camera, has the tolerance in the other direction? It's even better than before. It's not a 1.9. Now it's just a 1.5, but a minus 1.5. So I had that um, a few years ago with um, my camera was a Fuji S. What was it? Five, I think. S five, yeah, could have been. Um, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I purchased. It was a zoom lens um, from Nikon, uh, the twenty four one twenty, and it was so off. I I I sold it on eBay and I purchased another. So um, that was just the tolerance thing because of I'm I was not aware that I can I can fix that just in the menu of mm -hmm. the camera. So that is the reason why it's going wrong sometimes. Um, so there is nothing wrong. It's just the tolerance that not equalizes each other, that is in the other or in the opposite direction, and then we run in trouble. So um, the spider lens call, it's a quite cool tool. It's thin, it's tight, it's fast to use, it's durable. It's a kind of um, plastic. It's a um, what is the glass fiber? Is that an English word? Glass fiber, um, fiberglass. And, and, uh, fiberglass. Thank you, and, and and plastic mixture. So it's really really durable. It avoids um, expensive and time consuming corrections um, from the um, from the camera and, and lens manufacturer because of you can do it by your own and you can re check it. So a friend of mine, um, it's uh, Gianluca. He is working for um, National Geographic. Um, he's sometimes he's he's um, in um, Iceland and and uh, he's working in in a very cold cold uh, um, condition and then two weeks later he's crouching um, in the desert and capturing whatever um, small animals or plants or whatever so so he's always doing a, a lens calibration and again and again just to ensure that everything is okay with his camera so he's a quite um, yeah, 
<laughs> quite strange with strange. that because yeah because of he said hey when i travel around for two or three or four weeks and then i come back in my studio and i put everything together and i see that this was senseless because everything is a bit blurry and then yeah so he remeasures again and again and again just to being on the safe side so i'm um the the studio guy so i don't need to do it uh, those often, but um, if you want to be sure, then of course use it. Here on the top plate, um, you see there is a, a level inside with a little bubble, so you can um, ensure to to mount your spider lens call um, in level. That means 90 degrees to the floor. Um, and then in the back here, there is a little thread. Um, this is a quarter inch. It's the same that is on the bottom of your camera. That means the spider lens call can be fixed on a tripod mount, uh, on a tripod. Um, mm -hmm. You don't need to do that. If you have two tripods, then of course use it. Put the spider lens call on and your camera on and put them both in level. And um, then you need to put your camera um, between 20 times and 50 times the focal length. Um, the distance between your camera and the spider lens call. So there is no no precise um, uh, recommendation. That is 20 so times to 50 times. Um, that means oh, a, you, if, you a 50... Mean, sorry? Well, you, sorry, what do you mean by 20 times to 50 times? Um, the focal length. That means if you want to calibrate a 50 millimeter lens, then, um, then 20 times would be one meter. And uh, 50 times would be okay. 2.5 meters. So use this distance to calibrate your lens. And of course, the smallest ISO, maybe 100 or 50, whatever your, your camera offers to you, or 200. Um, and of course, the widest aperture. That means 1.4 or 1.8 or 2.8. It depends on your lens, of course. So the widest opened aperture. Um, then, uh, and if you don't have two tripods, of course, then use a large table if you have such a large table, or even better, put it on the floor. It, everything which is on the floor can't fall, can't fall down, so that, <laughs> that is the safe side then. Um, um, important is that both is in the same height, and I think that is easy to do. Sure. So then... Um, focus this little target plate here, which is in the middle, um, which looks like a smaller checkboard. There is a smaller one right next to the ruler. Um, this is for macro lenses. So what I do is I don't focus here right in the center of the spider lens call. I put the little uh, focus um, field or spot here, round about here. But important is don't, really don't, overlap to the ruler, never ever. So the whole, um, yeah. uh, the whole um, square must be here on that checkboard. And that's the, that's the whole focusing square. So you, yep. you go and change your camera to single autofocus gun sight. So just I a do. single focusing point yeah. to use it. Is yeah, that right? right. Yeah, yeah, right. I always use the single focus um, thing, the uh, single focus mode. And of course, then here, just on that checkboard, never ever overlap to the ruler. There's a reason for that. The ruler is that here, that little diagonal. Is that an English word? Yeah, diagonal, it's correct. Yeah. Oh, English is easy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that is that. Here is the ruler, and you can see it here now. You you uh, focused that little checkboard, which is that here, and when you look on the ruler now, when you when you focus that here, so the ruler must be the sharpest point here in that zone. That means the zero here in the middle. The zero is crossing the checkboard. And that must be in focus then. And the, 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 the bottom of the ruler and the top of the ruler must be, of course, blurry in that case. So, but let's talk about, um, about that a bit later. Um, when we put the outer focus point on, do it. I, I did it with two tripods. So focus it, capture it open that image 
on your camera's display or my recommendation is please use the big monitor. So put your SD card in your monitor and look at, watch the, the, the image or check the image on your big monitor. You can see much better um, where the, the focus point is, the depth of field is. Um, ooh, I, I, I hope nothing sorry. happened. Um, yeah, sorry, I should, have, uh, I should have muted myself. It's all good. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're cutting me away soon, but it's okay. <laughs> okay, okay. So, if if you no, come on, speed things up then. <laughs> okay, so um, we um, we focused that plate here is here, and you remember the image of the watch. The focus point was behind the second hand. Look here. Same happened here with my spider lens call. The focus point is behind the zero. Here it need to be, I focus that, so the zero, and behind it's sharp. So what I do is I open the camera's menu, the autofocus micro adjustment, and then I compensate the backward focus. And then I recapture that spider lens call, and then I recheck the next image and you see it's top so the outer focus is where it need to be but um, to be honest um, here in that little um, presentation I just needed one try and everything was fixed that is of course not the truth so you need to do it two three sometimes four or five times so you need to I, try I, out I how you were showing so I thought you were showing off there. It always takes me three or four times to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you need to do it um, two, three times to see how many or how, yeah, um, how many of your little um, scale in your camera scale, is, yep, it, yep. yeah, is for real in your camera. And that depends on the lens as well. That is the reason why you, you can't do, ah, here's just one, so I need one of the little um, um, scale in your camera is uh, one centimeter here on the on the lens call. If you do that with a 35 millimeter lens, it's, um, and, and you, you um, push the, um, uh, in your camera's menu, the autofocus with maybe two, of the of the scale, um, then yeah. it's it's less compared to use a two hundred millimeter lens and to do the same setting. Then it's much more. So the distance is is, is higher. Then you sure. know what I mean. Yeah. So that's a physical thing, and that is the reason why you can't put it one to one from that scale into your camera scale. That is why but you need to to try on error. But it is relatively it it is really relatively easy if you if, yeah. if it gets worse you just move the you move your little dial the yeah. other way in your camera and if you've gone too far you yeah. know eventually you come back to the right position yeah. so yeah if, if i can do it i reckon anybody can yeah of course so <laughs> I, I um i need um two or three tries to do that so that is quite easy but just to mention that of course Okay, so we have um, done that. Um, these are all the cameras that um, I know <laughs> um, which offer this autofocus micro adjustment or this autofocus fine tuning. So um, it depends on the, on the manufacturer. Um, sometimes it's called fine tuning or micro adjustment or autofocus adjustment. So look into the camera menu and um, find out how it's called in yours. If you see a camera that is not in here, but you know the camera offers that, then please let me know that in the end of the webinar, I will, I will add it to my list. Oh, you'll have to add the new um, Nikon DF that I've been playing with. Oh, yes, ahead. you are right. Absolutely right. And I tried that camera on a trade show two days ago. That's um, quite cool one. It looks a bit like mm. my, my um, very old, my beginner's camera, which was a Nikon F301. Yep. Okay. That's... Um, <laughs> Quite cool. Nostalgia. So then, um, with that, we fix the autofocus. But, yeah. What? No, go ahead. Just oh. saying, like <laughs> yeah. The trick is over. yeah. There, there is another reason why you um, could also use the um, the autofocus 
uh, the, the the calibration of autofocus with your cameras. This is what I experienced uh, with my with my kind of photography. Um, look, that is a pot tray that I shot here in my studio and uh, just to, to, to show you what I did. So my camera here in that case is here on the bottom and I focused in that little scale that zero. And this here is the balance of an autofocus. Normally the autofocus is balanced so the focal point is not right in the middle on the point that you that you focused in your in your little um in your what is the the So we're talking uh, about our, our depth of field, aren't we? Yeah, right. So if you from from the bottom, um if you um focus the zero, then you have one third in the front that is sharp, the depth of field, and two thirds of the depth of field is in the back of the point that we're in focus, that you focus with your um, diopter. So um, that is the normal balance calibrated by the manufacturers. Um, I had a lens that was my 85 1.4. And when I used it with a wide open aperture, um, I was aware of, OK, here is a lot of room for improvement. So I need to, it was really bl blurry. So it was um, quite soft. Um, and it was a back focus as well. So what I did is um, I used the spider lens call. It was a pre-version. Um, and I put it on a tripod. I measured that and I played around. So what I did is I opened the autofocus menu of my camera and I tried to fix it. But I completely um, adjusted it in the wrong direction. So it was even worse in the end. <laughs> not a problem. You can reset it. That is, that is really not a problem. But then I got a, I got a really good, great idea. Um, what if I would really um, disbalance or rebalance all my lenses to my needs? So I do people photography. Um, I ended quite often up in images. I, I focus the eyes, but because of one third in the front and two third in the back, the tip of the nose was already a bit blurry, but to the ear, the image was sharper compared to the tip of the nose. Huh? Those images where, yeah, they, I put them in the trash bin. So what I did then, I rebalanced all my lenses, also the good ones, to the opposite. Now I use two-third in the front and just one-third in the back. And now really clever. I focus the eye, tip of the nose is sharper, and to the ear, here you can see it here in the hairs, there is no ear, uh, but she has an ear, I promise. Um, <laughs> to, to the back, to the ear, you can see it here in the hair, it's softer. So um, that ensures that the tip of the nose is in focus uh, while the ear is, 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 is uh, starting to get blurry. So that is, um, that is quite good for, for people photography. Um, and of course, if there's anyone in the room who's shooting pet portraits, you might want to move it even further if you're shooting dogs and you want to get the start, yeah. or, or if your uncle just has a big nose. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have such an uncle. So. <laughs> and, and, and obviously, of course, you can just uh, close your aperture down and get a little bit more depth of field and you can solve it that way. But that, of course, kills the out of focus background, doesn't it? Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that is, that is quite good. And, and um, normally you don't have a chance to do that. So if you send your camera to the, to the manufacturer, they, they calibrate the autofocus, but in the other direction. So one third in the back, two third in the back, uh, two third in the, uh, one third in the front and two third in the back. Um, then, um, um, no, I lost the thread, sorry. <laughs> 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 that is good. So it just it gives you that flexibility to set them up exactly as you want, essentially. Yeah, right. And right. change it whenever you want. So if you were using your 85 for people all the time, then you might want to do this. But say, you know, I know Peter has a huge arsenal of lenses, but the ones he uses for landscape, uh -huh. there may be no need for something like that, you know? Uh-huh. 
right? Well, but, but uh, yeah, for landscape, you're normally shooting at f11, and so depth of field is probably not such an issue. But I do know when I'm shooting with the f1.0, f1.2, f1.4, that off. I, fi I find that <laughs> my focus is on the eyelashes and not on the actual eye. And that's because most camera autofocus systems will focus on the closest thing that is sharp to them. And that's the eyelashes, not the eye. So this technique allows you basically to trick it into focusing a little bit further back and then that way you can get the iris really tack tack sharp. So that's, I, I, that's a great idea actually. Excellent, I haven't done that, so I will be. Did you hear that? When I shoot with f-stop 1.0, that is, there's uh, a German yeah, word so for that, I'm, Angeber means. <laughs> <laughs> Well, is I mean, I like can do a 095, don't they? So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So, um, oh, one yeah. other thing to point out there for, yeah. for people who, uh, like, I like to shoot with my DF and with older cameras, well, mainly with that one, uh -huh. but using older manual focus lenses, you can, of course, do this as well. You can yeah. do the manual focus, it gives you focus confirmation, and you can still yeah. make the calibration adjustment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and when I do uh, um, not people photography and I don't use that rebalance, um, then I just open the the menu of my camera and I deactivate temporarily um, the autofocus micro adjustment, and then it's it's like the original focus. And when I'm back in my studio and I do my people stuff, then I go into the camera's menu and I just reactivate it. I don't need to recalibrate my lenses. The camera keeps that in mind in the memory. And, and when I um, reactivate it, then everything is working. So I can use it's both. One of those, yeah, it's one of those things. So many people go out and buy a fantastically expensive lens and mm -hmm. don't even know that you can do this calibration. And it might seem yeah. like overkill, but if you're spending hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands for an f1.0 uh -huh. then you know it's worth spending the maybe 10 minutes to do it and as you say that turning it on and off it's really a five second thing it's not yeah. like adding a huge step to your day of no. shooting no absolutely not that's true yeah okay so I think that was everything about. Oh no, I have I forgot to mention something uh, um, here in in that. If you have not a prime lens, um, a fix fix um, um, no prime lens. I think it's the word of those kind of lenses. So if you have a zoom lens, of course you can calibrate it as well. Just use the the focal length that you normally use with that lens. So, for example, you have a 70-200. You always use the 70 millimeters, but normally not the 200 focal length. Then please calibrate it with 70. If you use the whole range of that zoom, then, then please use the widest. That means the 200. Okay. Or the longest, do you mean? The or? longest? Yeah. yeah, the longest. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, then now let's talk about the um, the raw calibration. Uh, we have two tools. That is the spider two, uh, the spider cube, and the spider checker. The spider checker is. No, let's start with the spider cube. The spider cube is a tool to balance the contrast of your images in the raw converter and the spider cube uh, works with each raw converter really with each it hasn't an own software all what you need is um all the sliders that uh, offers that are offered uh, from a raw converter so here in that example and i will show you a demo live um in photoshop is um, the exposure slider and the black slider here in the raw converter. So um, these uh, sliders, they allow you to adjust a lot of um, adjustments in your raws, but all what you can do is, let's call that guesswork, in exposure, in the color temperature, and in the black tones. So. Normally, your images, they have no reference, and you need a color reference to do so. So look here. I played around with a black slider. Of course, too hard, much too hard. Here is, hmm, 
I think the black slider is okay, but the color temperature is off. And here I just clicked with a little um, with a little um, eyedropper. I clicked on the wall, but believe me, that wall is not neutral white. That is a kind of um, I don't know an English word for that. We in Germany we say, or in German we say, like an eggshell. You know what I mean? So a kind of beige. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, beige is good. Yeah. Okay, so um, that is that is um, definitely not a reference, and please don't use that to do the 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 color temperature. Put a reference in your images, and the spider cube is such a reference. It has an eighty percent, an eighteen percent gray surface. That and that is the same gray. It's not a bright and a dark one. It's the same. It's just because of the the, the light is brighter from that side. But a bit more information about that later. Then we have a chrome ball on top that is always overexposed because you can see the light source in that chrome ball. Then mm -hmm. you have a very bright white surface and it's a kind of pearled texture. So there is texture. And here on the bottom, it's a dark and also pearled texture, a dark black surface. And in the middle of that is a hole. And this is not to stick your little finger in. This is a black trap. A black trap means no light comes into that hole. And your eye can't see anything in that hole. It's completely dark. And even your camera can't see something in. So that must be, an, this area, this zone must be underexposed. RGB levels, zero, zero, zero. Capture an image outside maybe now. And uh, look if you can find some really um, underexposed, no, maybe underexposed, but um, if you can really see a complete dark, an absolute black in your image. Normally, not. So that is the reference to do that. Um, uh, <clears throat> sorry. And then here at that uh, point, let me stop my little presentation and go into my bridge. So look here, I have that image. And I want to, to set that here in the sliders. So I can do a bit guesswork. Yes. Maybe that, that, that. Maybe that is too cold. No, I think that I is I think too everyone's cold. been through that process of guessing. I swear when yeah. you're really getting into an image, you feel like you get cabin fever. Things start to look right, uh -huh. but maybe actually a way off. And, uh... Yeah. Yeah. So look here. That is... Um, and by the way, I, I know that image is quite boring, uh, but <clears throat> sorry, I captured that in the data color office here in Switzerland, and um, and uh, I I'm interested in that image here. But I did another image with a spider cube. Here we go. This cube is in the image. On the and let me explain a bit about that uh, situation here. On the left side here is a window, a glass door. Behind that is daylight. It's a it's a quite uh, bright um, area here. On the right side is a long, long corridor with a lot of offices, and the uh, the light source from here, from that side, is neon tubes. That's it. So what I do now is I use that little eye dropper, and I click on the brighter of these um, gray surfaces. I mentioned both sides are 18% gray. Why do I click on the brighter side? Because of that shows me that the daylight here is the more prominent light source in that area. So I compensate the daylight and now here in the leaves you can see the yellowish um, reflection of the uh, of the neon tubes. And this is the same um, let's call it light or white balance that my eye do here in that in that um, situation. So now, and sorry for that, my Photoshop is in German because of um, I speak German. <laughs> that is the exposure slider here. So I use the exposure slider and I decrease. Oops, I decrease the the exposure until the white surface is with texture. It's perfect now, and it's 
underexposed. It's a quite bright zone. So um, I set it to 250 here. If it's a lower um, light situation, then you use 240, maybe 230. It depends on the image. So um, if it's a really bright situation, 250 is fine. Then here, that is the little br black trap. And let um, let me put my little eyedropper in. Um, look here on the on the lower left side of the histogram. Can you see that? There is texture yeah, yeah. inside. Well, yeah. That is camera's noise, nothing else. So what I do now is I use that. That is the black slider. I use the black slider and increase it until the black trap is underexposed. Now look, RGB levels zero zero zero, perfect. Now all what I need to do now is to click that little context menu, click to yeah, save these settings, save them, and type in something here. So I will call them um, no guesswork anymore <laughs> and save. <laughs> so let me close that image back to my bridge. Now I click on that image, which um, is the more interesting for me here. Click your little preset icon and look, here is no guesswork anymore. Here we go. So I click on that. Now, please look at the image, look at white point and look at the contrast balance. Done. So how easy is that? Now I can use that preset for all these images that are captured in the same light condition. Right. Now, if you do uh, uh, event photography, for example, um, then of course you don't need to 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 do that and that click for um, for all uh, your your um, single images, your separate images. Just do it that way go into your bridge, then highlight them all. You know how to do that. Then click the right mouse button on your on your images. And look here, there is, da, 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 where are we? Here we are. That is the development settings. And look, here is the no guesswork anymore. And if I click that, all these um, activated or highlighted images will be developed with the same setting. So that is a quite easy process and fast. Okay, so let me close that here and let me go back into my presentation. Probably good to remind people or those who are just joining us, if you've got questions, make a uh -huh. note of them and we'll discuss them at the end because for people who've never seen this stuff before, oh, yeah, be wearing a lot of questions. Yeah, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. I forgot to, to deactivate the question session um, during the webinar. Please wait until the end. That is absolutely true, yeah. Um, then, how to use the cube? Of course, put it um, in your in your um, set in on location. Then capture it once. Then, of course, the step two and a half would be do your photo shoot. And then, in the end, use the spider cube to to um, find out which setting is which raw setting is the correct one for for that light condition. If you do reportage uh, photography or, or event photography or something like that, sometimes you need to be fast and you can't say, oh, wait, 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 lay down on the floor. That was, that, um, <laughs> that was quite nice. But uh, first, I need to capture my cube to have a reference. Hey, then do it in the end. Capture your images, but in the same light condition, capture the cube in the end of your photo shoot and you have the reference. Good one. It don't need to be um, done in the in the beginning of your photo shoot. So the only um, important thing is do it in the same light condition. That's it. Okay. Now the spider cube is, and that is what I want to mention. Um, it looks like we have it in three sizes. No, no, no. It's uh, just uh, it. It looks nice. <laughs> it's um, always the same size. And uh, the original sizes, of, co of course, it depends on the size of your monitor, but round about like that. Um, the spider cube is through pigmented. That means if you scratch the gray surface, it's not a problem. It's gray underneath. The same with the white, the same with the black. 
it's through Pigmented. Um, then it works with all raw converters. And uh, of course, um, you can do all these balances that I showed you in the, in the raw converter to balance your raw files. Um, just let me mention that the spider cube is, we call it um, spectrally neutral. That means that gray surface, for example, looks the same in each light condition. In neon tubes, in normal, the, the old-fashioned light bulbs, I don't know the right word for them. Um, tungsten. In yeah. Tungsten, thank you. And yeah. uh, in daylight, in, in, in any light source. So that is quite important. It's, it's, it's not just a gray. It needs to be spectrally neutral. There's a word for that. It, it's called metamerism. So that means a color can look different in, in different light conditions, but that is too much for that webinar now. So that is a special with the cube and um, uh, yeah, and important for you to know. So that is the spider cube. And uh, on the bottom of the cube here, there is a quarter inch a thread as well, so it fits on a tri on a tripod. Um, I use uh, or I give the cube to my models. Of course, please hold it. I need to 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 see that corner here to my camera, and then I capture it once. Okay, give me back the cube, and that is uh, fine. Then, um, if, if there is no no person in the set, then um, some and I'm um, the only guy um, on on location. Then I have a little. Oh, I always forget the name of these little things. A gorilla pot. These little mm -hmm. snake pots. You know what I mean? So yeah, the, the, yeah. the smallest version, I put it on and then I, I can um, put it wherever I want. So that is quite um, cool to, to use. Um, a normal... yeah, you should start to do some selfies, you know? You could put the self-timer on and go in there yeah, and yeah. smile with it. I think it'll look great. Yeah, yeah, right. O always in the bathroom and but I'm I'm still <laughs> I'm still working on my duck face, so I I can't I can't do it quite good. So <laughs> it's hard working. <laughs> um, That'll be the topic of our next webinar. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how to do the best how to how to do the bet uh, the best duck face so that would be quite hey i'm i i could bet that webinar will be will be overcrowded you know what i mean so <laughs> <laughs> don't you believe it <laughs> <laughs> hey, that would be a good test so <laughs> um no um then the spider cube, um, that could be one argument. So um, that is what I sometimes hear on uh, on uh, on stage um, workshops and 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 presentations. Um, that somebody says, "Okay, look, um, until now I used my gray card. What I understood is a normal gray card." Um, do a color balance. So I do the color temperature setting, and that's it. So the cube balances my contrast as well. And that is, of course, that is an advantage. But there is also a disadvantage with your little cube. And I said, what? What kind of disadvantage? Yeah, it doesn't fit in my pocket. And I said, pocket of your trousers? Yeah. And I said, hey, please, never, never ever put a gray card or the cube in the pocket of your trousers. Why? Because of they were in the washing machine and the washing machine was wash powder and wash powder <laughs> has optical brightener and your, your, your pocket would polish that optical brightener on your, on your gray card. So you, I can't see that. So of course, uh, white is whiter and colors are more colorful, but a camera sees yeah. A camera sees that as a bluish tone. Never ever put a gray card or the cube in your pocket. But the cube is made uh, from that solid and 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 durable plastic. Cycloy is the word is the word of that kind of plastic. But um, it's durable, and of course uh, you can put it into water. So if you put the the cube in your pocket, then please wash it carefully in the end. So remove that optical brightener. That is so important just to give that as an additional information here in that case. 
Then we can color balance our camera. Um, why do you need that? <clears throat> you would need that for um, reproducing fine art. You know what I mean? So when you when you capture um, um, paintings, mm -hmm. you need to... Reproduction work. Yep. Re yeah, reproduction work, right? You yeah. need to ensure that your image has the... I always call it real life color. So, or product photo shoots, or my stuff is fashion shoots. So my clients, all of them are so picky with the colors. I need to, to color calibrate my camera for those purposes. And um, I need it as well for wedding photography. Huh? Why? Are they so picky with colors? Uh-uh. No, they aren't. But I do wedding photography, and by the way, I hate it. <laughs> I, 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 I never <laughs> Don't tell it to my clients. So, um, <laughs> but um, I do it in a team. So we 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 do it with uh, two, sometimes three photographers, and um, my partner here in that case, um, she used a Canon, a Canon um, camera, a five. The Mark III. I have a real camera, which is a Nikon <laughs> D100E. No, that's always the, the same as with the Windows and Mac OS. So both has um, advantages and disadvantages. So no, no, just a, a, a bad joke. Um, so I use my Nikon and um, she used her Canon. So and in the end of the wedding, when I mix up all these images, you can see it here quite good. Um, uh, I let's call it faked the image a bit. What I did is um, I screen captured that Lightroom situation here, and then I increased um, the saturation of that screenshot. Why? Because of your view to my presentation is, of course, not color managed, and it's um, quite heavy. Um, it's compressed a word, so that JPEG stuff, yeah, yeah. because of that uh, the, the bandwidth of our of our connection here. So that is the reason why I pushed a bit the colors to ensure that you can see the differences of, of the images here. So sorry for that. Um, you can see that her CR2 files, CR2, I hope you can read that, um, because of it's very small. Um, the Canon is, and that is a Canon characteristic, is quite bluish, quite cold in color temperature. While my Nikon, the sun is always shining, even if it's foggy outside. So <laughs> that is quite warm in color temperature. And when I mix up all my images in the end of the day, so you can see, okay, that was from Run Photographer and that is from the other at the moment. Uh-uh. Don't do that. I could, I, I couldn't give um, that uh, a result to my clients. So that is um, really a no go. So what I did is I created two um, settings for both cameras: one for my Nikon and one from uh, for the uh, for the Canon. And when I apply them to all the images, which is quite easy, so I use the the filter. Just show me the, the Nikon images and then I click on the on the presets and then I do the same with the camera. It's not a minute and clack. All the images are the same. Now you can see here that little bubble with the sliders inside. All the images have a setting now. And you see it color-wise, you can't see a difference between the Canon and the Nikon. So if you deal with two cameras, and um, maybe that is your DSLR, and you use while traveling, for example, when you are uh, in USA and um, the whole day you captured a lot of images of the Grand Canyon with your big DSLR and the heavy one. And uh, late at night, you are walking with your um, wife or your husband um, uh, through San Francisco, a bit um, restaurants and looking here, looking there. You don't want to carry your big camera around. That is what I, what I did. So I used my little um, system camera and uh, it can do raw as well. Of course, I use it and uh, I can uh, balance them both. And in the end, really, when I do 
uh, a book of that um, of that journey you can't see or travel or journey what is the right word I'm not sure um, oh, you, okay. oh okay <laughs> so I, as I said English is easy um, so you, you can't see any differences between the um, the, the these uh, images of course that doesn't improve the resolution of the camera it doesn't improve the the, the quality of the image but color wise it's really a match and that's it uh, that's uh, what is really important um, for me for my workflow and I um, can imagine for yours as well. Okay, so um, the spider checker is like the cube, but a bit uh, more extended is a reference for your camera. The spider, uh, the spider checker works with Adobe Photoshop Camera Raw, with Lightroom, and with Focus from Hasselblad. So even if you have no Hasselblad, <laughs> you can use the raw converter focus from Hasselblad with your camera. They um, they support, yeah, I would say each DSLR camera. And it's really free of charge. You can okay. just download it from their website. Play around with that. Quite interesting. So then, um, as you can see here in that image, these... Um, these color references are replaceable. There is a little fade checker in the lower left side. Now you can see it with a, with a big arrow. That is a red square. And here, when you open that frame to remove the, the cards, there is one squared hole inside. And that means that that little fade checker can be bleached out by light, by daylight, by the light you use. Uh, because of that, the same light will bleach out all the color references as well. And when they are bleached out, you need to replace the cards. Um, when you open the frame, there's another indicator below that frame, which is always covered. That means that will stay in the original red. And if you see a difference uh, between that um, fade checker and the hidden one, then please replace the cards, just to give you an idea. I use the spider checker here in my studio now for uh, around about three years, a bit less. Um, almost three years and I still have the same cards and there's no difference at all. Um, the important thing is please close the, the folder, the housing of the spider checker. It's a bit like a, like a mini laptop. So it, you know what I mean? So you can close it like a book and then your color references are um, covered. They are um, protected from daylight and of course they won't bleach out. That is important. Then we have extended references for skin tones. Look here, they are all different skin tones. Use them to improve skin tones in your images as well. This is the replaced card. And if you um, spin them, so look on the back side of them, you see there is neutral gray. This is quite good to um, custom um, white balance your camera. Um, yes, you don't need it if you capture in RAW, but sometimes you have a situation where you need it. Um, for example, I did a photo shoot with uh, models and we were indoor. Um, we used an, an, a light source, which was a very long um, neon tube, so CCFL. And um, what, we, uh, what we did is we used a mixed light situation that that means um a daylight so when the daylight was a long curtain um a black curtain so you couldn't see any any daylight through the curtain but we opened it a bit and i would say it was a roundabout hmm, like um like a hand is um is wide you know what i mean so maybe 10 centimeter a bit more 
Um, and then we, I, I um, white balanced my my um, my camera, the customized um, um, version, so I was able to see the real color balance on my camera's display, because of I wanted to to double check and to judge if the daylight is maybe too strong or it's absolutely okay or if I need to bit uh, to to increase a bit the the daylight, <clears throat> because of I wanted the bluish reflection from the daylight, and here in that case it was much too much of daylight. So I closed the curtain to maybe just one finger, maybe one and a half, and that was okay then. Um, and I wouldn't be able to see that if the if the color temperature on my camera display is not the correct one. So sometimes it's really um, uh, useful to use that, um, that customized white balance. Here we go. We take a picture of the spider checker left side in, um, I did that here in my studio. So um, in the studio and the camera of course has, has its own color characteristic. That is normal, and um, this is not um, just with our uh, digital cameras. We had the same with our analog cameras uh, 20 years before uh, uh, ago. Um, a Kodak Gold was completely different compared to uh, whatever Fuji Velvia or something like that. So um, <coughs> there is always a, a characteristic of the camera, and also the lenses they have. Um, its own characteristic, and when you when you color correct the output with a color checker, then you get the real life colors. So this is how the color um, looks like in my studio than here in that um, situation. So and all these settings are done by the HSL sliders of um, Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, that means the raw converter from Photoshop, or Focus from Hasselblad. And all what you need to do is um, to use that plugin which is in, to click the right mouse button, to create that setting. Of course, we have videos that explain how to do that. And then you can choose that little preset here in your Lightroom, and it's really just a click, so you need Ah, maybe five seconds to apply the real life colors to your images. And that's an automated process. I think there is an additional hint, right? Uh -huh. We're waiting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm uh, no, waiting. Of course. That, yeah, of course, it will depend on your monitor after all of uh -huh. that. Even one of the cameras. <laughs> Right. Sorry, I remember. <laughs> yeah. Once the camera's right, it makes no difference if you're viewing your monitor as it came out of the box. Yeah, right. Um, of course, there is one place where the real color of your images is located in. And this is not your monitor. It's not the printout. It's the file. That's a binary code, just zeros and ones, nothing else. And that binary code need to be the same displayed on my Mac, on your Windows computer, on your mobile, on my mobile, wherever. So we all photographers need to speak one color language and that can be ensured by an ICC profiling and that can be done with the Spider 4 sensors. And then your monitor, which is the only window to your file, that your monitor shows you what is inside your image. Look, that is how your image really looks. And all the monitors, these are not calibrated, of course. All these um, monitors, that types of monitors can be calibrated, even iPhones and Android tablets. That is the chairs. So, and as you see it here, our LED is already supported. That will be the upcoming um, generation of monitor displays in the future. So, um, even projectors from projectors can be calibrated. 
Yeah, so all type of monitors. And uh, does it make sense to calibrate my 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 mm, cheap monitor? Yes, of course. It can be optimized. It can be um, color corrected. Of course, Spider won't improve the quality of your monitor. That means the um, the um, the vignetting, the for example, or the number of pixels. Yes. Um, that can be that can't be improved, but the colors can be improved. So please do it with each monitor. Here is a special offer, and I think um, yeah. So do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah, we have a special Kyle deal that is a 20% discount a coupon code that is spiderweb. Um, the uh, offer is available with that link. Please use that link. Um, just screen capture it um, to, to, um, to save it for later. Mm -hmm. um, but you will receive an, a follow-up email. And in that email, of course, we put the link again in. Um, so you have a special deal on the spider lens call, on the spider cube, on the spider checker here to balance your, the contrast and the color of your images. Then here the autofocus. And we put also in the Spider 4 Pro that is the sensor to color calibrate um, your monitor. And of course, even more than just one monitor. Um, the license includes, it's a site license. It includes all your own monitors on one location. Hmm. And that offer is valid until December the 16th. Just in time for Chrissy. Yep, that's true. So um, we will do more webinars, not with my strange and uh, lousy English. That will be done by uh, Peter and by Matt. Um, in a proper English, I hope so. So, <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> sure. Just fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to speak Australian anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, you, you know how to do that. Um, we have a Facebook page. Um, come to our Facebook page, which is uh, Data Color Spider Australia. Then uh, we introduce uh, that webinar here as well. There, uh, you will find more links uh, in in the future. Of course, um, we talk about photography. We will share um, Im important or interesting um, information about all about photography so we are photographers so that is um i think um a quite cool site for you to to submit or to join to share to to like then um we have a spider ebook i wrote it together with a quite famous editor here from germany he his name is christoph kuhne so he's a friend of mine. He has an own magazine all about Photoshop. Um, it's a, a Photoshop magazine, not for beginners, is more for enthusiasts. And um, and uh, yeah, we both, we wrote that book about um, color management. So we have six chapters. The first is all about color management, about um color spaces how to deal with them and so on so second is about um, uh, camera calibration the third is about monitor calibration the fourth is about monitor calibration in studio condition when you match when you need to match different monitors and so on so then the fifth is about uh, viewing so printing your images and the last one is about self-proofing different media types and so on. So um, I'm sure that is a quite interesting Spider ebook. Now the good um, the good info is it's free of charge. Just use that link here on bottom to download it. Just do a screenshot here from that page. Um, type in your name and um, and uh, download it. It's free of charge for you. Um, and then, if there an, are any German speakers in the room, if you QR code scan that one, that takes you to the German one for the English people if you've just scanned it. If you just replace the DE at the end with an EN, it'll get you to the English one. 
Oops, I forgot to replace that here. That's true. Ouch. So, sorry for that. Yes, you are right. So sorry for that. That is that refers to the German. So use the link with an en in the end, and then you have the English version. Another good um, information is it wasn't me who translated the book into English. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, just do it. Um, then we are online almost everywhere. We are on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest, YouTube channel, of course, and LinkedIn. And you can submit to our RSS feeds. So um, if you have to share um, images or information, if you find something out which may be improved or simplified your workflow and you think, hey, that would be a good topic for the Data Color Facebook page. And um, of course, we share your link to your website as well. Um, just talk with us. Get in touch with us and, and let's talk about photography. I think that is our, um, our um, shared um, um, passion. Yeah, that's much more than than just a job or, or a hobby that is really, really passion. If you have additional questions, of course, you can ask them here now. But um, if you have uh, later questions about your workflow, about our products, or if there is something wrong in your workflow, but you can't find it out what it is, get in touch with us. We have a free of charge online ticket support that is available here, support.datacolor.com. Please submit a ticket, ask whatever you want, and we will help you with, of course, um, a good question, a proper uh, uh, question, a proper answer. Answer. We will send you um, the answer you need or a link to a PDF or to a video that explains what you need to, to fix in your workflow. So, but just ask, just get in contact with, uh, get in touch with us. More or less, we are in the end of our webinar, but now I want to read your questions. And um, let me open that little chat box here. I can do that. Um, ooh, that is a long list. That is good. <laughs> that is quite good. So let's start with the first. Why does a screen require periodic? Um, calibrating. Um, I hope that I pronounced the word periodic. Um, periodic. Per period, periodic. 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 Okay. Time thank to time. You. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is good. Um, why does it? Um, yeah, you, you should uh, recalibrate your monitor twice a month. That is really true. Why? Because of the light source in your monitor will change. Will change. It's color temperature, and it will change the whole spectrum of light. That is the whole truth. Um, look, if you, if you just, um, just look at the, uh, the neon tubes in, in your office, in the ceiling, um, you have maybe uh, six lamps there. Um, then after three, four, five years, the first neon tube starts to, it, 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 it blinks all the way and it makes that noise. So you need to replace it. Put it off, go into your basement. You purchased a few spare um, parts of that and put a new one in. It's absolutely the same type of neon tube. It will be brighter than all the others and it has another color. Huh? What's wrong here? So the, the phosphors that, that are in, they burn down. Um, and uh, uh, this is what I already mentioned. It, it will change the white point. It will change the whole spectrum. And in your monitor, there are, you know that each pixel has three subpixels, one red, green, and one blue. And these subpixels, the, the light source behind your pixels is white, but you can see colors. Why? Because of each subpixel has a kind of its film a word. So um, the light comes through that film and that makes the colors. And these films, these filters, they will bleach out. The older they are, the less it is the situation, uh, is the saturation. So please recalibrate it twice a month. 
So here somebody has no volume. So sorry for that. That is a button on your computer, I hope, <laughs> or loudspeakers, or I don't know. Um, so I can't fix it yet. So sorry for that. Um, but we will uh, we will record that uh, webinar. So I think you can um, watch it later. Once um, the out of focus is spotted, how do you fix it when it is found? Um, once the out of focus is well, we, spotted, we probably got that was uh, that was a seven eleven question, and I think we probably answered that around about seven twenty. <laughs> so okay, I, I think, think we've there's a lot of the questions question. in the list have actually been covered at some stage. Okay, so we can go over that. What causes a lens to lose sharp focus? Ah, uh, yeah, we talked about that. Um, hi, one might. Um, so I'm looking for for uh, the little chat box here is quite um, small. So sorry, give me a second to read all that. Uh, we did that. Um, how useful is lens cal with a zoom lens? Um, yes, of course it is. Um, a zoom lens has the same issues, um, but please use normally the 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 longest um, um, focal length if you calibrate that. But if you just use the lowest one. So, for example, again, I know I repeat myself, but um, if you have a 70 200 millimeter lens, but you use it just with 70 millimeters, then of course calibrate it with 70 and not with 200. But if you use the whole range, then please, please do it with 200. And now there are cameras on market like the Canon D5 Mark III. This allows you. Um, also to calibrate a, a zoom lens on the lowest end and on the longest. So then you can do it twice. Very cool. Yeah. Um, do I have to change this for every lens I use? Yep. Now a good, a good news, your camera will remember the lens. You know what I mean? So if you change yeah. the lens, um, you, 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 maybe you calibrate the, the, the 50 millimeter, then um, it's, it's saved for that lens, of course. So now put on your 85 millimeter, calibrate it, everything is good. If you put back your 50 millimeter to your camera, the camera recognizes that. The camera sees the serial number of your lens, and um, the camera will use that setting, of course, that you cho uh, chose before. So, yes, that is um, necessary for each camera and lens combination, but um, that will be saved by the camera and will be used. Uh, OK, we talked about that. One down the list here. Um, you mentioned a Spider Checker plugin. Could you tell them a bit more about that? Um, yes, the Spider Checker plugin comes with the Spider Checker. It's a software that is um, on CD with the Spider Checker. You um, you um, install it on your computer, and that will be a plugin in your Lightroom or in your RAW converter. So that means if you, um, so wait, um, let me prepare something, and um, then I can show it live. I think that is easier um, compared to just talk about that. Uh, I open Lightroom. I will share my screen until my, um, my system works here, so I need a bit. Okay, here we go. Um, I hope that you can see my screen now. Can you? Uh, I think it's still loading on my side. Yeah, it's still loading on mine oh, as well. We <laughs> oh, ouch. Okay, so. Oh, that's priority treatment. You got yours before I did. <laughs> so. Yep, mine's here. Yeah. Okay, so yep. there's a little table tennis um, thing and graffiti in the in the background. You see that, yep. right? Okay, brilliant. So um, when I want to to um, to color calibrate those images here, um, I let me. I need to make that a bit smaller. I like so okay. shot with a Canon as well. So yeah, this was a very. Um, I was in Cologne in Germany um, last week, and we did um, uh, a recording. What is the right word? Um, 
uh, we recorded a, a, a TV show. So it's an online TV show. Photo TV is um, the name of that. So that is the reason why the setting has that name. So that is the reason why I mentioned that. Um, this was a, a, a very small Canon. Uh, could it be a 650D? Something like that. Um, could be, yeah. Yeah. And um, um, we captured that, that image here. And let me scroll a bit down. Here are the HSL settings. You see them here? And um, so that is the original color out from uh, out of box, out of the camera. And the cameras are, they, they, they make the colors more saturated because of uh, for for consumers, so that means um, people that are interested in I want nice colors, not I want real colors. So um, a setting, and this is what we created. And now look at the settings here, and look at the colors here in that image. I hope that you can see them. Tuck, especially the blues. Let me bypass that here. So I hope that you can see the differences in color as well. It's quite huge. So, but that is always the compressing here in the in the webinar. So I hope you were able to to see that. And look at the sliders. Yeah, and look at the sliders. You can see all these um, these uh, quite complex um, corrections. So how to do that is I capture the spider checker once, then. I need to cut it off to do it that way. That, do that. Then I need to set everything here. Um, again, we have a video that explains that quite good. So I won't do it now here. It's just a bit. So just for example. Um, then you click with the right mouse button on your checker. And there is, again, sorry, my Lightroom now is, in, is, is German. I uh, weren't prepared uh, for that. I click on Edit In, and then I have the Spider Checker app here. And when I open that, let me do that. Yes, I want to edit. Bearbeiten means edit. So Spider Checker will be opened. And ta -ta -ta -ta, here we go. That is the spider checker. The software knows all the colors that are in the checker. And now it measures the colors. I put it here right in the middle of that. Oh, I cut it quite good. So if is uh, this is not in center, of course, you can squeeze it here to right in the middle. So everybody, uh, every uh, square fits in the in the patch. So now the color, uh, the, the, the um, color checker software knows the reference colors. And at the same time, it measures the color that was captured by your camera. And yeah, now it's easy to calculate the difference and to calculate the correction that is necessary to, to adjust the color or to correct the color. And that's it. Hmm? Look here, the green is, the green is uh, quite different. The gray is quite good. But that is different, and that is different. The yellow is quite good. So you see that the color is is um, the deviation or the 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 wrong color of that uh, Canon camera here is it's it's not it's not linear. Okay, so yeah. and here you can save. Um, that means uh, I want to save the calibration for Lightroom, for the Adobe Camera Raw, and for Focus for Hasselblad. And here I have um, three different options. The, the middle one is colorimetric one. That means real life colors. Then I have a saturation. That means I want real life colors, but a bit more punchy. That is what I use for weddings, for example. And here is a quite cool thing for, um, for fashion stuff and portrait and so on. That is portrait means um, it makes real life colors, but skin tones will be a bit less in orange and, and, and red, just a bit desaturated. That is quite cool. I use it quite often. So let me click on uh, on um, finish, and uh, just to to sh to show you that here I uh, mentioned that I use that for my stuff here as well, and I use my private computer here, my um, not not 
the uh, the data color computer. Here you can see the 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 five D Mark II. Here I have the settings for the D eight hundred and the V one, which is my um, little system camera. And we have here in the studio a little Fuji X one hundred. So I have all these settings here, and I use them, of course. So yeah, that's it. How it works. So back to the questions. Um, here we go. This, that is uh, what we already answered. Um, yeah, it, I, it, I, while you're having a look, I'll just say that the spider checker doesn't yet work with Capture One, so you'll have to uh, have to no. work on it for us on that. Yeah. Of, of, uh, unfortunately not. It doesn't work with Capture One. Why? Because of did you see um, all the sliders in the in the in my Lightroom um, that were used to correct the colors, um, and Capture One hasn't enough um, color channels. And that is the reason okay. why yeah why um, Aperture um, and Capture One is not supported. So okay. sorry for that. So there is a reason for that. Uh, here's a good one. Um, does sRGB or Adobe RGB make any difference in calibrating your camera and or your screen? Um, not really. Um, S I yes and no. <laughs> so sRGB is a smaller color space compared to Adobe RGB. That means your camera has an own, um, it's called gamut. Gamut means um, it has an own physical color range that is capable by your camera. Um, look, your camera ha um, has a physical limitation. That is, uh, just capture an image of uh, such of these, um, what is the, the, the English word for that? Let's call them street constructors. I'm not sure. They have these neon orange um, or neon yellow jackets. Just oh, capture oh, one. Yes, the, um, yeah, the, the the safety vests that we have, the fluoro safety vests. Yeah, for made example, out of bright orange or bright yellow. Right, yeah. right. Capture them and check the color on your camera, or even on your monitor, or even in a printout. Can you see that color? No, that is out of range, out of gamut. That is the word. So. Um, sRGB is a smaller color gamut compared to Adobe RGB, but your camera is normally able, and uh, all of them normal uh, uh, that I know um, that are on market, they are able to capture Adobe RGB 9098. So I would recommend to use that color space. Um, a printer has a much smaller color space, but um, a printer a gamut is quite good in quite strong in yellow and in cyan. And that is the reason why I always recommend Adobe RGB because of that is um, more or less covered. Just a little bit is missing. If you would use sRGB, you would lose a lot of um, colors in your printouts then in that case. But if you do photography work for web purposes only, that means for websites, and they never be printed, your images, really never, then go with sRGB because of that is the most common in web. But yeah, no, if, no. If, if you print your images, then please use Adobe RGB 1998. But I think that is um, a more complex topic that we um, should handle in another webinar then. Um, and also in the Spider ebook, um, it's, it's described in there. So you can, you can see, um, yeah, what is the difference. Okay. So um, did you find another question that is? In, um... A few people have asked whether they should be using uh, the uh, the spider with their ASO color edge monitors and yeah because some of the ASO monitors got a built-in color emitter so obviously you don't need one but some of the others don't in which case you would be most um, uh, good good idea to use a, a spider for sure yeah 
yeah right right um the the this um, hardware calibratable um iso monitor calibrates um by its own um sensor that is true um it's not calibrated in the middle in the center of the screen that is a bit mm -hmm -hmm. but uh, of course it, it's it, it's a very good screen and the uniformity is really good uniformity means is ha it has no vignetting so um, that is that is normally not a problem. But um, if you also want to calibrate your external, your, the the second screen, which has no um, separate sensor, then yeah, you need a spider or your laptop, for example. Or if you want to calibrate a, a front projector, your mobile, or if you want to match two different ones. Yep. Or you want to match different ones. Really? Yeah. That's a true. question I often get asked yeah. um, is, uh, it's not. I don't know if it's in the list here, but uh, it follows on from that one. That either I've got an ISO or I've got a Wacom or you know one of the high-end monitors, or surprisingly enough, I've got an Apple and it just looks great out of the box. Do I still need to calibrate that? And I think we've covered this, but the answer is definitely yes. Even yeah, definitely. the most expensive monitor that's got yeah. a huge color gamut, as he was explaining, that yeah. just means it can show yeah. lots and yeah. lots of colors. If it's not showing them accurately, then you just no. have lots and lots of incorrect colors. Absolutely. Look, um, that was um, um, the the question before. Um, we talked about that ISO CG, so Color Edge series. Um, this is a monitor that costs around uh, three and a half thousand US dollar. I don't know how much um, uh, Australian dollar is. It is. So sorry for that. So maybe you can um, uh, uh, tell how how expensive. Um, such a monitor is in your okay so um this uh, even this kind of monitor has an inbuilt um sensor so you see even such a such an expensive monitor need to be calibrated so then guess what uh, what need to be done with your with your um iMac for example and I use a seven, uh, a seven, uh, no, what is the word? A twenty-seven inch iMac in my studio here as well. One of those um, newer, um, yes, of course. And uh, the white point is um, calibrated. And what's uh, even more important compared to the white point is the linearization. That means um, all the three color channels need the same tone response curve. Very, very linear. So that need to be the same and this can be just done by a uh, calibration did you find other questions so i'm just talking 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 and i'm i know that you browse the questions so you are the question leader now <laughs> <laughs> did you have any um peter uh, well i'm just thought, yeah you're far away mate um, this is one uh, for you, Oliver, because I'm not sure the answer on this one, but they're saying they have a Spider 3 Elite. Um, is going to the Spider 4 much of a difference? And then just feedback that they enjoyed the webinar. Okay. So the question is here in that case? Uh, so they have the Spider 3 Pro Elite screen monitor, a uh, screen uh, spectrometer to calibrate their monitor. Yeah. Um, is the Spider 4 much difference oh now i got it sorry um the uh the spider 4 compared to the spider 3 is um in average 26 percent more av uh, more accurate depends on the type of monitor that you use and uh, we tested it of course with tons of monitors um and there is um uh, the spider 4 has double shielded filters that means um they are like in a sandwich and uh, they are protected from um, from um, humidity and so on. So um, that is uh, quite important as well. And um, just a second. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and there is another firmware. And that firmware, together with the Spider software, allows to contact um, our data color database. And that database has all the information about the different physics of monitors. So when you install the Spider 4 software, it asks you, please allow me to contact Data Colors database and please allow it. 
Um, don't be afraid. It won't share your private emails and your bank bank account stuff <laughs> with us. Um, th that that is another uh, country that uh, which um, does those <laughs> things. Um, it's not Switzerland. <laughs> no. Um, what it does is um, it looks in your system in your computer and it sees which monitor is con is connected to the video card. And for example, it's a, a Sony one two three whatever. Um, so it then the spider asks our database, "Hey, I'm dealing with a Sony one two three. What can you what can you tell me about a monitor?" And our database will answer, "Oh, that is a monitor that has white LEDs, no RGB LEDs, white uh, LEDs. It has a normal gamut of." Uh, 105 percent of sRGB. The red is red is that. The green is green is that. The blue is blue is that. And it will shift. Um, um, so uh, a kind of hi um, history um, of that monitor will be that and that. That is the estimated um, um, yeah shifting color in the time. So all this information is stored in that database. And when you calibrate your monitor, you share your calibration data with that with the same database as well so that means it learns it learns and it can calculate a good optimization or correction curve to your calibration that makes profiles much much smoother and much um, better so that is and mentioning what mm -hmm. you were saying there about the the different uh cards and screens and all of that kind of thing there's someone here uh, sharing just a comment uh, their experience was that they had a green color cast and they went to lots of people and no one could work out what caused it and after lodging a ticket with data color that you guys found the problem and suggested that they uninstall the control panel of their video card and just use the color calibration right the spider Abs offered. absolutely right uh, spider creates an ICC profile and in an ICC profile there are two parts of color correction one is the white point correction that will be handled by your operating system Windows or Mac OS together with its applications like Photoshop or Lightroom or InDesign or whatever you use aperture so um, that is the white point correction, and that that will work. That is not a problem. The second and much more complex part of that color correction is that what I already mentioned, that linearization. So these are three quite complex curves that um, that uh, um, optimizes or that calibrates your RGB channels. And these curves, that they will be flashed to the LUT lookup table of your video card. And those additional tools, NVIDIA control panel or ADI is the catalyst control center. Um, these tools, they offer a kind of Mm, let me say calibration toy. So he, you can open a, a, a little, uh, it looks like the tone response curve in, in Photoshop and you can tweak the colors and you can make the contrast more punchy or, or duller, whatever you want. So now, even if you say, hey, I never used that. So that shouldn't be a problem on my computer. Yes, it is. Why? Because of the correction curve is in the video card on the lookup table. And if you still run that little tool, the NVIDIA um, tool or the ADI tool, then this tool um, frequently checks the lookup table and sees, hey, I, I was never been used, so I have a flat line. Hey, what is going wrong on that lookup table there is something very strange but there need to be a flat line and it overrides our correction curve with its flat line and you can imagine that is not good and then you run into color casts greenish reddish bluish whatever so please deactivate those tools on our website, of course, in the FAQ database, we have a standard answer for that. But if you can't find it, of course, then contact us and we will help you with uh, solving that issue. And if you are unsure how to, um, how to, um, or what to um, un, uh, um, or deactivate in your MS config, and this is Windows only. 
If you have a Mac, calm down, sit back and enjoy. It's not for you. <laughs> so um, now that uh, if you're unsure how to do that, of course, you can send us a screenshot of your MS config entries um, in the startup folder, and we will help you what to uh, deactivate. Of course, not a problem. Great. There's one, uh, well, there's a few actually coming through here. I'm not sure what time we're running to, but I think we're getting close to time. Several people asked about is the this webinar available to download later, and then someone asking where they can watch it again. Yes, it will be available afterwards. Um, I will share that link with my colleague and uh, with Anita. Anita will upload it. it uh, that video and she will share the link in her follow-up email so i don't know the link yet <clears throat> sorry that will uh, this will be created by anita and she will um, offer that link in the follow-up email so please keep an eye on that follow-up email um the again the the special offer from kyle will also um share it with that email as well Cool. Now, do, do do you find some other stuff in here? I can't see any there may new. Be there. just, there's a lot of, that we've covered or that were duplicate questions in the list. It's a bit difficult to find. Other yeah, only maybe just as a final question we've got, there's one where, you know, when we're using the color checker, do you use do you need to use it every time there's a different color environment or a different lighting environment? And I think the answer is for the best result, yes. But for instance, if you're shooting a lot outdoors under the Australian sun at uh, between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, I would imagine you could use the color checker and create a profile that could be adapted to very similar lighting conditions yeah. and it would go part of the way to correcting a result for you. Obviously, yeah. it's not as good as doing one for each, but it would possibly be an improvement on what you were doing before. Absolutely. Great. Oh, I'm glad I got that one right. <laughs> <laughs> Go team okay. Oz. So there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of thank yous. Yeah, thank you, thank you for listening. Um, I think if there is no further question in the next minute, then we are done here at that um, point. Um, again, thank you for listening and uh, please keep an eye on our Facebook page um, to see newer webinars for um, Australia or uh, look on, 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 on the website where they will be offered as well. Um, yeah, so I don't Great. see any. No, oh, here is one. You mentioned the, last the one there. Yeah. yeah. The, the the last um, question here from David is um, you mentioned the one third rear two third front calibration balance and how you swept that uh, that over. Can you please confirm how you actually made the balance change to the ter uh, two third front and two third back? Yeah, just visually on the ruler of spider lens call. So on the spider lens call, you see normally if the uh, if the autofocus is 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 proper is um, is set to the to the um, current uh, to the correct uh, setting, then you see um, when you uh, focus the 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 little checkboard, um, the zero is matching that normally. Then you can see behind the zero is two third that is in focus and one third in the back. And what I did is that I um, that I balanced the focus to front focus, but just a bit until I have just one third in the back and two third in the front. And you can see that on the ruler of the spider lens call. So the the sharper zone, the, the depth of field will be more on the lower side of the spider um, lens call because of the lower side is the uh, of the ruler is the one that is in front of the little checkboard. So this is how it works. Yeah, that's. Um, I think it may be worth pointing out. Uh, it, we mentioned earlier. I think the term was used. Um, that that's how the lens manufacturers make them. It's actually. It's not like they put a setting in. Oh, let's make this thirty-three in front and sixty-seven behind. It's actually a property of physics. Every fifty mil lens at the same distance at the same focal point will have the same ratio breakdown. 
So it does vary slightly depending on how close up to your object you are. But so what he did was actually make it front focus slightly in yeah. effect. It wasn't like going in and telling the lens, let's just play with those numbers as if they're artificially set. Yeah. Um, here's one um, other interesting thing is uh, most colors are not really recognized by viewers unless doing products. Why is it so necessary? So I think this um, this is uh, about uh, monitor calibration, right? Um, uh, yes, but if you edit your images, I could bet that you want to see how your image really looks. So, um, would you paint an image with um, with uh, with water colors or with oil colors um, when you wearing uh, bluish tinted sunglasses on your nose? I'm sure not. So that is what I meant. Your monitor, the only window to your file, need to show you the colors how they really look, and this just can be um, assured when you calibrate your monitor. And it's not just the color; it's also the 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 white point, which is color as well. Oops, uh, which is the brightness that is very uh, very um, uh, important, and um, the contrast as well. Also, the gradient of your of your um, image. So that means the tone response curve. Just calibrate it. You will see that the the color uh, the the shadows are a bit more open quite often so yeah there are a lot of reason why you need that um no that's it um thank you thank you again for listening and um yeah i would say that uh, the last word goes to you so um again let me thank you for listening i'm um i'm done then so, so um, bye bye. <laughs> Take care, and um, again, share your information, your images, uh, and something like that. Share it with us. Um, click our and like our Facebook page. Want to see you there? So, bye. And now, the last words to you guys. Uh, thank you very much. I'll uh, look forward to coming along and having a chat next time around. Yes, likewise. Um, I don't know if we actually announced that, but Peter and I will be doing a few of these over the next couple of months, so um, it should be fun. And thanks for having us along. I think we say goodbye, and that's goodbye. That's good night from me, and it's good night from him. <laughs> Catch you guys. Cheers. Good night. Bye bye.